thanks so much for being here. Hey, Dan, thanks so much for joining us. So glad to see you. Um, so today we get a special interview um, with Dan um, Grieb. I hope I'm saying your last name right. How, how do I say your last name? No, you said it right. It's Grieb. Okay, awesome. And uh, Dan Grieve was the coach and the guide um, for Chris, and I'm going to mispronounce his name. So how about you say it for me, Dan? Nickich. Nickich. Okay, awesome. So for Chris Nickich, who was the first um, Down syndrome um, person to complete an Ironman. And so um, I'm so excited to get to interview uh, them and possibly Chris as well, but um, we're just so excited to have them um, to just kind of share some inspiration and courage and light for us. Um, so Dan, thanks so much for being here. And I'd love to just start off with, tell us a little bit about you. So first of all, you're a Keller Williams agent. Yep, I'm a Keller Williams agent here in Orlando, Florida. I um, have been in real estate for 16 years. Uh, I've been a triathlete for the last five years. Awesome. So tell me about your journey of why did you decide to start do being a triathlete? Yeah, well, for me, um, you know, I, I believed a long time ago. Well, let me back up. You know, I was raised relatively poor by a single mom. And, and in the environment in which I was raised in, you know, I was often told that you couldn't have it all. And, you know, I, I wanted to be a police officer. I became a police officer. I got into real estate. I, I started to, re to experience a lot of success in real estate. And, um, and due to like some growing up and, and issues that I had growing up, there were some things that I wanted differently. You know, I wanted to be a, a good dad. I wanted to be a, a good husband. I wanted to be, um, I wanted to have a business that mattered. I wanted to, you know, practice my faith at a super high level. And, um, and, I, and I remember I had this like thing in my head, you can't have it all. Mm. And, um, and I remember like not being healthy. I was 300 pounds. And, um, and I remember my friend saying like, Dan, what are you complaining about? I mean, yeah, you're, you know, you're a hundred pounds, 150 pounds overweight, but like, you've got plenty of money. You've got a great wife. You know, your relationship with your wife is awesome. You got great kids. They, they're well behaved. They know, they know you love them. They love you back. You know, you got a good business. The people that work for you really respect you. I mean, you can't have it all. You can, you know, what do you, you know, don't worry about it. And in my mind, I was like, yeah, that's right. You know, I don't, I don't want to like ruin my marriage to get healthy. I mean, I got a good thing going here. I don't want to ruin being a good dad to get healthy. I mean, I got a good thing there. I got, you know, I've got some money and a great business. I don't want to lose that trying to get healthy. And I, I don't want to interfere with my relationship with God getting healthy. So I was just like, I'll just take a pass. And, um, and one day I just kind of woke up and I was like, am, am I telling myself a story or is this even true? And I noticed that there were other men in my world, other people that I knew that had their health as well as a great marriage, as well as a good business, as well as, you know, they were good dads and they had good relationships with God. And I just decided to challenge that. So I asked myself the question, you know, what is a physical activity that I could set a goal to complete? Um, that would be very challenging. It would take me a long time to get there. And so the idea was that I would complete an Ironman. And for those that don't know what an Ironman is, it's a race that um, is 140.6 miles long. It starts with a 2.4 mile swim. And then you do a 112 mile bike. And then you finish it off with a 26.2 mile run. So you do a marathon at the end. Um, you have 17 hours to do it. And if you complete it in 17 hours, then you are stamped with the title of Iron Man for the rest of your life. Um, and I thought, well, that's pretty cool. But like, I, I don't want to like get in shape and then get out of shape a year later. So what do most people do? Most people train for a year to become an Iron Man. In my case, I said, well, I'm not going to do it one time. I'm going to do it 10 times. And so I set a goal to do 10 Iron Man events in two and a half years, in two years. And I ended up doing that, just that, uh, 10 Iron Man events, uh, several full Ironman and then several half Ironman throughout that time all, all across the world. That's incredible. Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. That's no awesome. Um, hey, I think that this is really important what you just now talked about of sometimes we can leave 
start believing the lie that we have everything. So why mess up a good thing? Like what was the ultimate catalyst for you deciding, okay, I need to um, deal with my health? You know, uh, I, I jokingly tell people when I speak that I was, uh, I, at that time I'd been married, let's say I'm 20, I've been married like 17 years and I was laying in bed with my wife. Um, and do you know what most people who've been married 17, year, 70, 17 years do when they're in bed? They play on Facebook. What did you guys think I was going to say, right? We play on Facebook. She was on hers and I was on mine. And um, Facebook has this thing called time hop where it shows you a photo of one year ago, two years ago, three years ago, five years ago, and seven years ago. And what I noticed is that I had not lost any weight in seven years. I had, I had said, I'm going to go on a diet next year. I'm going to lose the weight next year. I'm going to do something next year. And over the course of seven years, I hadn't lost any weight. And uh, matter of fact, it was just getting bigger. And I just, you said, you know, enough is enough. Like, I'm going to stop trying to do all these fad diets. I'm going to stop, um, you know, stop saying tomorrow. I'm going to stop saying that. I'm just going to go do this. And whatever the cost, I'm going to go do it. So if it means that, you know, I lose money in my business, then so be it. If it means that, you know, my marriage goes backwards, I can't see that happening but because my wife supported me. But so be it. If it means I got to take some time away from my kids, then so be it. And here's the crazy thing about that story is that, um, financially, I made three hundred thousand dollars more the, in, the next in, in two years later than I did when I started. I um, my marriage has never been better. My time with my kids has been better. You know, I expanded that one area of my life, and it expanded every other area of my life. And I think that um, this changed right here. The way in which I think changed um, as to what's possible. And um, and as that changed, then all of a sudden, you know, the possibilities started to grow and my um, ability to grow into them happened as well. That is awesome. Thanks so much for sharing. Um, okay, so you complete 10 Ironman and then what happened? I mean, what kind of took you on the journey of meeting Chris? Yeah, so for me, what happened is, um, you know, as you can see, these medals right here, these are not Ironman medals. These are just like marathons, Disney marathons and different other events that I did. And these are just a small portion of them. Over the course of uh, the last five years, I've literally done hundreds of races. In two years, I did almost a hundred races, 5Ks, 10Ks, marathons, things like that. Um, for me, I, I once I got my health and proved to myself that I was gonna stay healthy the rest of my life, um, I, I said to myself, how do I express my gratitude to God? I mean, I got my health back in my forties. I mean, who does that? It's very hard to lose a hundred plus pounds and sustain it in your forties. Now I'm 46 years old. Um, I was like, I need to express my gratitude to God. And, you know, from what I know, the best way that you can express your gratitude to God is that you can give to his people. So I said to myself, I'm going to hopefully give someone else the benefit of what I had, which is becoming an Ironman. And an Ironman is not about an event. It's about who you become in the process. It's the discipline that it requires for you to wake up every day. I wake up today at four o'clock in the morning every day. Today, I mean, it's what, it's 10 o'clock. I've already biked 25 miles and ran two miles today. And I still have to work out tonight. I mean, like, that's just normal activity, right? Well, I want other people to have that ability. And so I wanted to specifically do something where I use my body to help someone else accomplish this goal. And at the time, um, the only people that you could lead through an Ironman was a blind person. And so I started looking for a blind person that I could, could guide through an Ironman. And, um, and, you know, and I was willing to like put my time aside, like let them move in with me, um, pay for them to come to Florida where it's hot more often. You could train like whatever it could take. And I, and I tell this joke a lot, you know, what do you think is the hardest part about um, preparing some, a blind person for an Ironman? Any guesses? The swim. No, it's finding a blind person that wants to do an Ironman. <laughs> That's the hardest part about the whole thing. Okay. Because like there was nobody to find. And, and the people that were blind that did want to do it, there were five other people that they already knew that were like, I'll help you do it. So it became very difficult for me. And I started to believe that um, maybe my dream wasn't going to come true, that I wouldn't be able to express that level of gratitude to God. And here's the thing, you know, I, I, this is not a religious time with Dan call, but I, I do have my own religious beliefs is uh, the interesting thing about God is that God um, oftentimes answers your prayers, not the way you want and bigger than you ever thought possible. 
And, um, and in my way, he didn't give me a blind person. He gave me the first person with Down syndrome to do this. And our relationship did not start off initially with him saying, hey, I want to I want to do an Ironman. It started off with Chris and his father um, doing Special Olympics race. They did a sprint triathlon. And uh, they, they had a coach and they were working with her and Chris got too fast for her. And then they wanted to ratchet it up and do a, a race that was a little bit uh, longer in distance, a 25 mile race that's called an Olympic distance. And uh, they, they came to our triathlon club where I'm one of the assistant coaches and where I'm one of the captains of the team. And they asked me um, if I would be interested. And I said, of course I would. And that's where the journey towards this Ironman started. That's incredible. So who was it? Was it you or Chris that decided finally, like, let's do a full Ironman? It was actually Chris and his dad. Um, I took Chris to do an open water swim and, you know, something I do, you know, like three times a week where we swim in lakes and there's one lake called Lucky's Lake here in Orlando, Florida, where you swim across the distance of this lake. It's 500 yards over and 500 yards back. And if you do it, successfully swim across and swim back then when you're done you get to sign lucky's house i've done it my oldest son's done it my youngest son's gonna do it and, and i took chris to do it i've taken a lot of people to go do it um and chris went and did it did it with me and i had to leave so when he went to go sign the house he went up with his dad and when he signed the house he wrote chris nickage world champion and when he left his dad was like world champion like what could chris be a world champion and he just said chris like do you think you could be an Iron Man? Like you just did a like really big swim here. Um, do you think you could be an Iron Man? And Chris was like, I don't know. Let's, you know, let's try it. And uh, they they came to me and said, Dan, do you, do you think uh, do you think Chris could be an Iron Man? And I said, you know, why not? Let's give it a try. And here's the reason why. Um, my whole life as a young person, um, I was told I wouldn't amount to much. You know, I come from a troubled background, a single mom, and um, I was in trouble a lot. And uh, and I was often min minimalized, you know, told you are not going to amount to much. Well, that's the life sentence of a person with Down syndrome. And, it, and people with intellectual disabilities are told their whole lives, um, you're not going to amount to much. Their parents are told by doctors and experts, you're not going to amount to much. And for me, I was like, well, let's, let's see what's possible. I didn't have these limits for Chris. And, and it, I guess some of it was because of how I grew up myself and like everybody deserves a chance to be great. And um, number two is I didn't know a lot about Down syndrome anyway. Chris is the first person in 45 years I've ever met that, knew, that had Down syndrome. Um, he's the first person that I ever had a relationship with that Down syndrome. I didn't even know someone that had a child with Down syndrome. I didn't even know someone who had a brother that had Down syndrome or sister with Down syndrome. I just never seen them. And it isn't like people with Down syndrome just like just happened this year. They've been, they've been involved in our communities and our culture, you know, for generations. And so um, for me, the, the big piece was, why not just give him a chance? And I, and I don't have these limiting beliefs for him. And uh, Nick, his father told me, hey, be careful because uh, you're the first person that's ever told me that Chris could amount to something. You're the first person to ever believe in my son as much as I do. And I said, well, I mean, I love them. Let's do it and let's give it a shot. And so we did. And uh, it was really interesting. A lesson that we learned that I've learned is, you know, even the best people, that, the people that love you the most will sabotage you. And they won't sabotage you like to try to hurt you. They'll sabotage you because they want to protect you. And um, they'll say things like, um, I read this as a quote. It says, people will slowly kill you with simple words like be realistic. Like if you told Chris he had to be realistic, then Iron Man is out of the out of the question. But see, for Chris, an Iron Man was never his goal and was never his dream. See, people think that. Like that that was never even that today is still not something that really matters to him that much. He could give or take being an Iron Man. Now the rest of the world thinks it's this big thing, and, and Chris thinks it's kind of a big deal, but it's really not that big of a deal to him. Um, he knows that it's a big deal to everybody else, so therefore he kind of receives a little bit of that but to him his goals and dreams are not that chris is very clear on his goals he wants to live independently he wants to own his own house own his own car and marry a smoking hot blonde like his mom which by the way is not some uh sexist statement about objectifying women see for chris he doesn't think like us 
what he says is smoking hot blonde is his dad refers to his mother as his smoking hot blonde. So he wants that. And for him, a smoking hot blonde is not a person, it's a concept. And that concept to him is the same concept that all of you want. And that is this, his mother loves him unconditionally. His mother looks past his disability. His mother hugs him and is there for him whenever he needs her. Who doesn't want that? So when he says smoking hot blonde, he wants that. And by the way, you don't have to have blonde hair. <laughs> it's my favorite though. Whenever I heard that in an interview, I mean, I, oh, I loved it. It was amazing. He went to smoking hot blonde. Yeah. Exactly. Awesome. He wants, he wants yeah. what I want. And he loves my wife. My, my wife has brown hair, dark brown hair. He loves my wife, but it's a concept. Yes. Well, I love this. I heard you in an interview say that Chris has a superpower. Yeah. Well, Chris has, has um, limitations that are also superpowers. Uh, one limitation that Chris has is obviously he has Down syndrome. And the thing about Down syndrome that's different than like other intellectual disabilities that, again, I've only been involved with for a little over a year, is what they say about Down syndrome is Down syndrome is written all over his face. You can tell by looking at him that he has some type of disability. Um, and what Chris's intellectual disability is in the simplest way that I can explain it is you and I have a highway that has seven lanes on it. So traffic just moves on your highway very quickly, you know, either way. Chris's seven are down to two. So he's got to take all this traffic and he's got to move it down just these two lanes. And as a result, it takes so much longer to process everything that goes down those two lanes. Well, that's because of that, Chris doesn't live in the future and he doesn't live in the past. He lives in the present. And his superpower is that Chris doesn't really, I mean, his limitation is Chris doesn't really get everything. He doesn't understand social norms. Like there's no way in hell we can keep Chris from hugging anybody. He's going to hug you. He doesn't under, like, he doesn't get the whole concept of coronavirus. He's like, they're people and I love them. I'm supposed to hug them. That's what you do. You hug people. And he doesn't get all of the rest of that. But his superpower is human connection. Chris understands human connection better than anyone. Chris can feel that you are hurting and he will hug you. He can feel that something is not right and he will hug you. Uh, Chris hugs people when he's happy. Chris hugs people when he's sad. Chris hugs people when they're happy, when they're sad. And one of the lessons that I've learned is that you can solve a lot of problems if you just hug people before you spoke to them. If you just said, can I give you a hug? Like, could you imagine how we could um, de-escalate a lot of the drama and stuff that happens in our lives if we just stopped and said, can we just have a hug? And, and with Chris, he doesn't understand like the social norms. Like, like if he was to hug, you know, you for the first time, it's not like this little like come together, hug. All right, that's two seconds part. He hugs you until he's done hugging you. And like, that might be a minute or two and that might you know, reach into that weird place. But here's the deal. Most people get into that weird hug with Chris and they feel weird for a minute. And then, and then they let, they, they let down that guard. And then all of a sudden they're like, I, this is exactly what I need every day. Mm. You know, I, I, during the race, Chris has to, the way Chris um, recharges his batteries and recalibrates is with a hug. Like when he's in major pain, he'll say, Dan, I need a hug. And it might still be here. I'm going to show you this. He hugged me so many times during the race. I don't know if you guys can see. He wore the skin off my shoulder. So that's a scar right there. He hugged me 17 times. Uh, no, at least 17 times. And he didn't shave like I'm not that well shaven right now. And his rough facial hair ripped the skin off my shoulder. That was the worst injury I had from the whole race. I love it. Because it wasn't a short hug. It was a good, meaningful hug. It was like a hundred good, meaningful hugs. <laughs> That's amazing. Okay, so as his coaching guide, this has been my biggest question. I'm like, Dan, there were moments. So if you did not watch the race, he got off the bike several times. But one time he got off the bike, he uh, was in some ants and they bit all over him. He started swelling up. Um, he got back on the bike, he fell. Um, at some points in the run, he was just done. He felt like he couldn't go any further. And so as his coaching guide, I just don't understand. How do you know when to keep pushing him and when to say, hey, it's okay. It's okay. You don't have to do this. 
right? Like how did, how do you know? Well, th those are a lot of great questions and understand like as his coach and his guide, you know, one of the things that I have to remember is it's not about me. Right. So as much as like, I recognize like I'm, I'm either going to be the person that guided the first person with down syndrome through an Ironman, or I'm going to be the person that drowned the person with down syndrome. I'm going to be the person that killed the person with down syndrome. I'm going to be the person that helped the down syndrome person fail. Like all of those other things that go through your mind. But I just constantly at the beginning reminded myself, this is not about me. This is about Chris. This is Chris's race. And what's important to Chris, we're going to accomplish. And the second thing is, is I know Chris's preparation. I was with him for a year of training. So I know he's prepared. And, you know, life is going to throw at unexpected issues at you. Like we, we literally are, we're prepared for a bike crash. I knew his blood type, everything he ate, his allergies to, to, to medicines. I knew where the local hospitals were in case he crashed and I had to go to the hospital and tell his dad where we were. I knew his blood type, everything. Like I was prepared. We had a contingency plan that if a car was going to hit Chris, how I would run my bike into Chris and I would take him out. We both would go to the hospital. We had contingency plans for everything. We did not have a contingency plan for ambites. We did not think about ambites. Um, we had a contingency plan for a crash. Uh, we knew what would happen if it crashed. Um, and so when, when life comes at you like that, you know, sometimes you might be out of gas, but that's where the power of a community comes in, right? Because sometimes when you don't have enough perseverance, you just have to borrow someone else's. You know, I remember as a young man uh, growing up and looking for role models and, and people that I could um, look up to. And the, those, for the most part, those men did not exist. They didn't exist. They weren't around um, for me to really say, I want to grow up to be like them. And I remember saying as a young person that when I get older and I thought older was 40, when I become 40, I'll be a gentleman. I'll be older. Um, I'm going to be that person to other people. I'm going to be someone that when, when, when they go looking for a mo role model, or they go looking for someone that, that they can look up to that I would be that. Now, I know that the first step in that process is me being worthy of it, right? So if I was to say, hey, George or Greg, or I think it's Elena or, or James, hey, I'm really proud of you. And I was like, not a good human being, that would mean nothing to you. But if I said, hey, Tara, like, job well done. Or if I said, James, like, I know you can do a little bit more, buddy. Just stay with me. Believe me. Like, if you don't believe yourself, believe me. I got you. Like, like. Like if I'm the, that person in your life, then, then maybe you'll give me more than you'll give yourself. And I knew for Chris that I had spent the year being that person. And I remember like one of the things that I had said to myself is that I don't lie to Chris. Like I don't lie to Chris. Chris has no idea how far a mile is. He has no idea how far 10 miles is. He has no idea how long a 10 minute mile should take. So I could just take the easy path and lie to him and be like, Chris, it's just one more mile when it's like 13 miles, but he has no idea anyway, but I've never lied to Chris. And there have been times where like, um, you know, I've, I've had to do something or had made a commitment to Chris and for whatever reason, his parents are like, Hey, you know, like Dan, like wave that off. You don't have to do that. I'm like, no, I have to do that. And they're like, why? I'm like, cause I told him I would do that. Like I have to show him that he can trust me because I knew during the race, I'm going to say, Chris, do you trust me? And he's going to say, yes. Like, you've never lied to me. You've always been there for me, Uncle Dan. I'll do that. And that's the, the last thing I want to share with you is that uh, people ask me this question a lot. Um, you know, are you disappointed like the race is over? Are you disappointed a whole year of training with Chris? Um, and the answer is no, I'm not disappointed because, you know, at the beginning I was Coach Dan. And now I've got a whole new title and my title to him is Uncle Dan. I'm, uh, I'm the closest person in Chris's life outside of his family. And so now I'm Uncle Dan and uh, my ticket is punched with him the rest of his life. And so, you know, I think I've grown up to be the person that his parents could trust to like let him sleep over with us, come do stuff with our family. And, uh, and he's now included in our family. And it's, it's a good thing. That's awesome. I love that. Um, hey, I did want to ask you about his dad and the training. His dad's a pretty special person. Um, and I loved this picture of him and his dad. And there's a board behind him. Can you tell us a little bit about that board? Yeah, that's great. So yeah, a few things about his dad. I do think his dad um, is one of the greatest human beings I've ever met. Nick is a, 
a really amazing person. He's a He's actually an immigrant to the United States from Montenegro, a Yugoslavian country, or I might be saying that wrong, the former Yugoslavia. Um, he, uh, he actually had to uh, learn how to play basketball so he could go to college. He ended up playing um, college at Johns Hopkins University. He's an engineer, he owns a business, and he just loves his son. And you know, a lot of the er areas in my life that I'm missing, you know, not having a good dad, I say like, Nick is that. And uh, I'm really proud to call him a friend. I'm proud of who he is. And what you see him doing here is hugging his son and just recalibrating. Like this is, you can see the look on Chris's face. Like Chris is not feeling love for whatever reason, either he's scared or he's anxious or he's in pain or he just did a hard training session or there's something that's going on. And he just needs a little bit of that human connection. He's borrowing some of his dad's power right there um, to, to kind of, process what's going on and i'm so blessed to tell you that there's only two men in chris's life that i'm aware of that get what i call the hug of vulnerability and that's that hug of vulnerability and i'm one of the two that gets that so it's really cool now behind him is um is chris's goal board um this literally is a month by month calendar of what chris has to do and if you look um can i can't talk to screen so take your your mouse and go to nick's head here the father and go to the left of his head. So right here, it says my dreams. His dreams are well-defined and they're written out. And to the next, to the right of that, it says milestones. Like when I'm gonna do this race, and when I'm gonna do that race. And then to the far right is the goal. And that is Ironman Florida. And then up here, if you look, just go up a little bit higher on the mouse, right? Like, yeah, right there's fine. Go to the right just a little bit more. So it's, yeah. See these boxes there, it says bike, run. Those are the things he has to do each day to get 1% better. See, Chris doesn't have the ability to go from, you know, zero to 10 in one day. He can go from zero to one and one to two. When Chris and his dad started this process, um, you know, two years ago, Chris, Chris was actually getting heavy. He was out of shape and he was on his way to living the life of every other Down syndrome person. He was gonna be out of shape, unhealthy, not very educated, not challenged, minimized in society and was due to be isolated um, and to not live a very fulfilling life. And his dad said like, we're gonna stop listening to the experts. We're gonna take the lid off, give you a chance to do whatever you wanna do. And they built this, this board and say, what do I gotta do today to get 1% better? And they started with one push up, one sit up and one squat. And just before the Ironman, Chris and I did uh, 200 push ups, 200 sit ups and 200 squats. Um, before our next race, which we think will be in October, him and I are going to do 500 push-ups, sit-ups, and squats all at one time. And this is a person that has Down syndrome. And Down syndrome is a chromosomal issue that prevents you from building muscle. It's very difficult for them to get muscle. Chris couldn't eat solid food for four or five years of his life because he didn't have enough muscles, muscle tone in his mouth for him to chew food. And now he does 200 push-ups. Like there's a, a lot to learn, but if you make a commitment to getting 1% better every day, and, you know, Chris's growth is so small and incremental that most people say like Chris isn't growing at all. But if you look at where he started to where he is, he's way up here. But if you look, you know, one day, you don't see the growth. It's a very hard concept for most people to understand. And most people think like, Chris doesn't want to be an Ironman. Chris doesn't want to train with Uncle Dan like he does. Like, because Chris, sometimes he's not excited about running. But you know what Chris is excited about? He's excited about hanging out with Uncle Dan. He's excited about being part of a community that can do something. He's excited about hugging all of the, what he calls the ladies. He, you know, he's excited about attention that he gets. Because if not, the alternative is him sitting on the couch playing video games uh, and his parents like weighing with this reality. Um, when is our son gonna die? Because uh, most parents of Down syndrome children, and this is you know based on what I know, and it may not be completely factual, this is what I know from they've told me, is that for generations, Down syndrome people typically only live to be about 30 or 40 years old. Well, now with new technologies and understanding Down syndrome, uh, they're starting to outlive their parents which really, really frightens them because they say like, who's gonna take care of my son when I'm dead? Who's gonna take care of my child? Because nobody can take care of them like, like they can take care of them. 
You know, I know Chris really well, but I don't have 21 years experience with Chris. Um, I understand, I'm starting to understand how Chris thinks and sees life, and, but he does things that surprise me all the time. And I'm like, like, why are you into that? Like, you're supposed to have Down syndrome. Why are you talking to me about that? Like, you know, or, or, or whatever. And it takes me off and I'll call Nick and I'm like, hey, how do I handle this? And he's like, oh, he's 21. Of course he's talking to me about that. Of course he's doing like, what? He's not 21. I'm like, but he has Down syndrome. He's like, no, no, no. That's like, that's normal. I'm like, okay, okay, I get it now. But like, they worry about that. And so for me, you know, one of the greatest honors of my life is the discussion is like, hey, Nick, Patty, if anything happens to you, which is Patty is his mom, like Mindy and I will take care of him. And, and the plan is not, is not for like him to move out of mom and dad's house and to move into our house. The plan is for us to, while Chris's parents are alive, is to transition him into some kind of um, ability for him to live either independently or mostly independent. So he doesn't need me to like, care for him daily. He needs me to be there, like help him with like complexities of life. Like, Hey Dan, how do I, like, you know, I want to, I want to buy this thing. You know, am, how, how do I do that? Do I, you know, cause he doesn't understand money. So he, you know, maybe he could learn it. We're going to try it. We're going to teach it to him. We're going to, we're going to work to teach him that, but he may never completely understand what a million dollars is versus a hundred thousand versus $10. So we'll see what happens. So good. Um, well, I know that you said that Chris is sick today. Um, I wanted to share with him this quote or share it with you too. And oh, you don't and have to take it um, off the screen. Okay. You know it. Watch. Take it off the screen. Okay. Okay. I'm trying. I'm trying. I'm trying. <laughs> okay. Right. Ready? Yeah. Our fear is not that we're inadequate. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We say to ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, talented, and fabulous? I say, who are you not to be? You are made to make your light shine, as children do. I'm going to paraphrase now. Mm -hmm. You're playing small so others don't feel insecure around you does not serve the world. And as you release yourselves of your fears, it unconsciously gives permission for others to do this. I bet I've memorized, I've had that poem memorized for 15 years. Because I recognize the fact that, like, we all struggle. Like, everybody struggles with, do I matter, right? And so I literally have this campaign that was started by another woman in my town. But I, um, she gave it to me. She says she gave it to me. Her name's Vicky, but I won't let her give it to me. I just borrowed it. It's called the You Matter Campaign. Mm -hmm. And I see these cards. I give these cards away to people. And if you were to get a card from me. Let me see if I have one. I'm sure I have one right here. That's it. I don't have one right here. I, I'm not prepared, um, but oh, here they are. Well, you didn't know I was going to ask you that. You see this? Oh, that's awesome. Because I think that, you know, in a world we live in right now, the number one thing that Stacy, Greg, George, James, I can see who else is on here, uh, Tara, and whoever else I can't mention, the number one thing that you need to know is that you matter, that you have a place in this world and what you do matters. You know, if you have children, the number one issue that they need to know is like, hey, listen, like you matter. Like who you are, exactly how you are with your, with your um, imperfections, like that matters. Like, that's good enough. Like it's okay. In a religious conversation, and I'm not going to go too deep with this, I had a person once tell me that long before you can tell someone that they need God, is you have to let them know that they're worthy of them because they feel broken and that if there was a God and God represented goodness and you determine who that God is on your own, that they would not be good enough for him. So they stay away from him. Mm -hmm. And the reason why that resonates with me is because I lived 19 years of my life believing that if there was a God, that that God was good. And that in that goodness, if he came upon me, he would not want to be near me because of how uniquely broken I was and that I didn't matter. And so I spent 19 years of my life, like letting God stay in his lane and me doing my best is to not interrupt goodness because I'm bad and God is good. And as long as I could stay over there, well, now as an adult, one of the first things I recognize is that, um, that there is a God and that he looks upon you and says, I know how broken you are. And I know what you've done to screw up. And I uniquely you, I'm going to use everything that you've done to screw up to prepare you to do something great. And I'm gonna kind of go into another, this is not religious talk. Um, 
But um, I'm going to go into another thing is I have these three guiding principles that I live by. And I'd like to share them with you guys. And the first one is simply this. Life is 10% about what happens and 90% about how you respond. There will be times in your life where you do some really stupid things and you mess some things up. And if you respond the right way, people will actually trust you more, love you more, respect you more because of how you responded to what happened, not what happened. Um, the second thing is you are at the place at the time, experiencing what you're supposed to be experiencing, going through what you're supposed to be going through as preordained by the God of the universe. Like none of this is happening by accident. And when you're going through it, like nobody ever complains because I like going through like the good stuff. Like, God, why do you have me making all this money? I don't know how to handle this. Like, God, why is my marriage so perfect? I can't, my wife is so amazing. My husband's so great. God, my children, they're just so respectful. Why would you do this to me? Like, we don't ever do that. It's usually like the valley seasons, like this valley where like life is just not making sense. And in that valley season, I always ask my friends to ask two questions. Number one, God, what are you preparing me for? Or question number two, God, is it, what is it that you need me to learn? And then the last guiding principle that I have is simply this. Today is the first day of the rest of your life. Like it doesn't matter what happened yesterday. It doesn't matter mistakes you made or, or what the market did or what you said or how it went down or what. Just today's the first day. For today's the first day you start putting it all back together. Today's the first day you start finding love again. Today's the day, you know, you start forgiving people, you start getting forgiven. You know, it's a process. And today's the first day of all of that happening. And, um, and, and that's what I like to share with people. I'm sorry, I went on a tangent. That's amazing. No, thanks so much for sharing it. It's so awesome. Um, okay, last question for you is I feel like you've gone through this journey of success to significance right? Success in you've completed all of these Ironmans and you were doing them on your own. Success in your career. Um, and tell me about like the next stage. If you're looking, um, I would say you're living in significance. And if you're looking at someone with success, what are the questions that you would have them ask themselves to get themselves up to the significance? Right. Well, I think that that's a great question. And I think that I'm not in a significance phase. I'm in a legacy phase because it's not about me anymore. And I, and I, I will say that um, uh, I think that in real estate, first question we should ask ourselves, most people are in real estate, I know there'll be others that may, maybe not are in real estate that'll watch this, is that you're gonna have to ask yourself a unique question, like right now. Um, and I, and I have no disrespect to real estate as an industry. I mean, I am where I am today because of it. No disrespect to Keller Williams. I mean, I love Keller Williams. I, I've learned so much. However, our industry is designed to keep you small sometimes. Like there's, there's two paths of success in real estate. There's the path of um, what I call wealth, which is defined to me as a life free of anxiety. So wealth, or there is a path over here that is called fame. So you've got rich or famous, which one do you want to be? Okay, if you want to be famous, recognize that you're going to have to do a lot of crappy work, deal with a lot of crappy stuff, and it's not going to be glamorous and it's not going to be fun. But you're going to become wealthy. If you want to be famous, you're going to post a lot of stuff on Facebook, tell a lot of stories on Instagram, maybe get invited to do a bunch of speeches and, and do a bunch of talking. But here's what we know. There is not a single award that I'm aware of for the most profitable real estate agent. There's the one that sold the most houses. So like if you... Like, I don't know, like, I don't know what the big numbers are where you are, but let's say if you said, hey, someone makes a million dollars, like, that's awesome. You like, what's your GCI? It's a million dollars. All right, awesome. How much did it cost you to get a million dollars GCI? Well, it cost me two million. Like, did that person win? Or like people like start like adding people to their team and they ask the question, which by the way, you didn't ask me and I didn't answer and I wouldn't have answered anyway. How many people are on your team? Like I, my initial response, is like, why is that? How's that valid? Like, What are these people going to learn from that? Like, how many units did you sell? Again, like, how are these people going to get any better? All right, well, um, what was your volume? Like, another useless metric, metric of success. Like, the only answer question, if you ask me, I'll answer is like, tell me about your profitability. Man. Like, how much money will you make? And tell me how you do that. Because I can tell you how to sell a lot of houses and lose a lot of money if you guys are really interested. I can even write some books on that. Um, I can teach you guys how to like, you know, get awards for volume that sit on your wall, but they will not pay your mortgage. 
Um, they will not help you stay married. They will do nothing for you. Matter of fact, I throw away all sales awards. I keep them for a year and then I throw them away. Cause it's like, that doesn't do anything for me. It makes me believe like I'm this amazing salesman, but I have to keep working. I have to keep evolving. And the only thing that really matters is profitability. So as a real estate agent, what I think we should all do early and often is if, if our business is a vehicle of which we're driving, then profitability is the steering wheel. Like we navigate left, right, all determined about profitability. I get, you know, and, and get out of this. And again, world according to Dan Grieb, and I don't need to go too much. You can talk to me offline about this. I do not think that a, a real estate team is a saleable asset. So I think as a result, you have to get out of this idea that like I'm building this thing that I'll one day sell. Like get out of that because it's not going to happen. Like I don't know anybody that sold a real estate team and we got like, here, here's your $2 million off to your private island, go buy your Learjet. Like that doesn't happen. And, and here's the deal. Real estate provides you the ability to have like crazy profit margins. Like if you want a saleable asset, like go buy a hardware store where the margin is like you sell a hammer, you make 3%. You know, you sell, you know, a shovel, you make 5%. And if you make like 10, 15% profit per year on your gross sales, like you're killing it. Like, and then you get to sell the hardware store with all the hardware later and maybe you get a big check at the end. But that's not the business we're in. We're in this business right now where you guys can like make profits of like 50%, 60%. If you're like a single agent, like you can make a ton of money. Well, like be as profitable as you can for as long as you can and take all those profits, put them in the, into investments like real estate, obviously, stock market, deferred compensation opportunities, other things like that and go be wealthy. That should be the focus. Now, typically you hear agents like they get to my level of success. They sell a couple hundred homes a year and they start saying things like, I hate buyers and sellers. And I hate this. I hate that. Like, how the hell can you say that? Like you're a millionaire. Like you hate what made you a millionaire. Like you're crazy. Like stop that. That's just an act that people say because they want to sound significant. I love working with buyers and sellers. Matter of fact, I still work with buyers and sellers because I know that I'm the most profitable member of my team. If I go take a listing, that's the most profitable activity that Dan Grieb can do. Yes, I can hire a bunch of agents, but now I'm in this like role of splitting their commissions plus they're paying Keller Williams and I got to provide more tables and chairs and computers and admin people and it just gets watered down. The most, the best thing you could do is stay small and keep it all, build a great business, maybe add people over time as you want to kind of like leave your legacy upon people and create like your way of selling real estate, you know, the Kent way of doing it, the Rogers way of doing it, you know, uh, the Brown way of doing it, the Ellenberg like system of real estate. And you want to go like give the best of you to others so they can go get what you got. Like I'm down for that, but don't do it so that you can like show up at a Keller Williams event and be like, how many people are on your team? Like 17 and 16 of them haven't sold a house this year, like irrelevant. All right. So anyway, another soapbox. So good. I, lo I love it. That was a good soapbox. It's so yeah. good. Awesome. Well, um, hey, well, I really possible. do it's what? Possible. What I'm saying is possible. Like behind me, by the way, do you guys want to hear some cool stuff? I'll be quiet after this, but like this is behind the scenes. Do you think there's any way in hell that I color coded my own books like that? <laughs> ESPN did this. It, ESPN interviewed me right here. ESPN they, did that? Yeah, they came in and they're like, we want to interview you here. And like, I'm like, okay. And they're like, but we need to like fix your book. So they came through and they color coded all my books. They moved, see these medals over here. They're, they're, they moved them over here. See all those medals. These are actually my Iron Man medals. They moved them over here. I have an Iron Man plaque above it. I got you see that up here. They moved it so that in their shop would be my Iron Man stuff. And they color coded all my books. <laughs> I didn't do that. But anyway, these books, me, these are not books. These are my mentors. Mm. My mentors can hang out with me if they promise me that they will make my life better. There's not a single book that is sitting here that is not of someone that's making my life better. If someone is not making your life better, get them the hell out of your life. These are my mentors. These are the people that I take advice from. I'm not taking advice from people that are gonna tell me to do dumb things that are gonna destroy my family, destroy my business or not make me better. I want you to do the same, like don't even open a book. Like here's one right here I can show you real quick. Do you see this book? Like see how it's all tabbed out? Why should anybody be led by you? It's like 
look, there's notes in it. Like, like I'm, I'm, I'm not going to read a book if it's not going to make me better. I'm going to hold this book down and squeeze every bit of make Dan Greed better out of it. Mm, that's awesome. You know, I mean, and there's like, you know, all these books, you know, I'm, I can go through any one of these books and tell you that there's a something in there that matters to me. And that's the reason why I have it. My only problem is, is I keep giving them away and I'm like, oh, where's that book on Profits First? And I'm like, shit, I gave that away to somebody. Damn, I gave it away. <laughs> hey, I recommend that one. That's good. Cool. Yeah. I, I know it's time to wrap up. I can no. answer some more questions if you want. Yeah, you're so good. Well, I just want you to know, Dan, um, that you have made such a huge impact. Um, like I know that you go around telling people that they matter. And I just want you to know that you matter. And it really is significant what you and Chris accomplished together um, and that you were a part of his journey. And so I asked my good friend, Kendra Reef, to come in here. Um, so she was um, one of my friends. I also have a cousin um, that has some Down syndrome babies. And anyways, whenever I told them about getting the opportunity to interview you, she was like overcome with tears. And then she was like, "She's he's got to know how impactful he was in my family's life. So anyway, wanted to let Kendra tell you thanks. I'll try not to cry because there's, you know, like <laughs> a few other people on this call that I have to see every day, you know. <laughs> um, but I, as a parent, we, we advocate every day. As soon as our baby is born, we're advocating for their lives. Sorry, I said I wasn't going to cry. Um, but what, by brace, embracing what God gave you and adding to your legacy and your story and taking on that responsibility and seeing Chris's worth um, and what God was able to do through y'all and what Chris was, a you and Chris were able to accomplish um, advocacy wise, I could talk every day for the rest of my life <laughs> till I was blue in the face and not be able to accomplish what y'all were able to accomplish. Um, the people that you were able to reach and um, what you were able to prove about my baby <laughs> mm. and what she is capable of. Sorry. Nobody, I mean, it's, I just, I want you to know how, <clears throat> how much that means to us. Mm. Um, and I hope that somebody has told you that before now. Um, but yes, I wanted to say thank you and thank you for sharing your story. Um, and thank you for just doing what God led you to do and pushing Chris and believing in him. Um, yeah, I mean, just today I'm going to um, talk to some pediatric residents um, about Down syndrome and, you know, about my child and from a parent's point of view um, and and just being able to talk about Chris in general is going to prove a point that I couldn't prove before, you know, like that I knew deep down, but I couldn't necessarily prove before. Um, and I, I thank you for that. <laughs> well, Kendra, I mean, I, I obviously can get very emotional to this too, because um, I knew that, you know, I didn't know much about Down syndrome a year ago. But I can tell you, I mean, like we're having a transparent moment, just you and I, you know, I was very abused by my father and I grew up needing what a person with Down syndrome could give me, which is an unconditional hug anytime I needed it to let me know that my brokenness was okay. And only a person with Down syndrome could understand and feel that. Well, in other cultures, they call Down syndrome divinity because it is the closest of what we can see in God himself. And I promise you the rest of my life, I will not have a Down syndrome child. I will be someone who does not have a Down syndrome child that will forever talk about Down syndrome people and why they need to be a necessary part of every community, not just an Iron Man community. And just as God has a plan for my crazy life and what I went through, there's a reason why he's prepared you specifically and this daughter for a reason. And I, it is my hope that you'll be okay if uh, Tara shares with me your phone number because Chris and I are going to call you and your daughter this evening. We're going to do a FaceTime and we're going to talk to you guys, okay? Chris is a little under the weather, but he's going to call you anyway. He wants to, and that's what we want to do is we want to 
impact people in a positive way. And uh, I'd love to do that. We're not celebrities. We're just people that, you know, God gave us an opportunity. And, um, and if it inspires you, why not just do a quick call and, and, and you see what's possible. And if all of you want to follow this journey, just follow me on Instagram, follow Chris on Instagram. That's where we post what's happening. Um, and what you just said, just so that you know, uh, Chris and his dad, and I don't know how live this is, but I don't care. I'm very transparent. We have to talk about like what's next for our relationship, right? I mean, I just took a year off of work and now we have sponsorships and all this other stuff. When I heard you talk, I, I made up my mind that I don't care if I, what this means, I'm not stopping. Like, I don't care if, if I have to lose, you know, uh, half the money, like this year I lost about 20% of my potential income. If I have to lose a hundred percent of my potential income, my, my mission is big enough and reason enough to do it because of look how impacted you are by a bunch of knuckleheads running a little race. Well, thank you so much. That, that really means, I mean, cause as a parent, it, it does reflect on my daughter, you know, my specific daughter and um, what, how the world is going to see her and what they see that she is capable of. Um, and just coming from mom's mouth, <laughs> you know, like that, you know, it goes a little further when Chris, you and Chris can sit there and actually um, prove it. Um, and it, it just, it speaks louder than, than my voice. And I really, really appreciate um, your work in that. No, it's my honor. I'm blessed to do it. I mean, I'll just tell you what this, this is the, you know, I may have done a few like cool interviews recently. I may have been on access Hollywood last night, <laughs> but this, this was better. Thank mm -hmm. you. Thank you. God bless you. Thank you for, for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Hey, awesome. Thank you, you so much. Will you, will you text me her number? I will. Thank and you. you'll get to meet Kate, Kate the Great is her name. Kate the Great. Kate the Great. Got it. Kate the Great. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, thank you so much. What an awesome message for our Thanksgiving week. We're so appreciative of you. Um, and so thanks so much for everybody who was on to you. And hopefully y'all got something incredible out of this to you. So, okay, great job. God bless. Have a great day. You too. See ya. Bye.